Wet bulb temperatures are used in the field of psychrometry. Psychrometry is the study of humid air, air that contains water. Now, I found videos explaining what wet bulb temperature is, or at least how to measure it, but none of them conveyed the significance of why. When is it that we use wet bulb temperatures and why is it that we measure them? Why are there particular interest in process and chemical engineering? Let's have a look. Let's start with something that wasn't obvious to me when I learned about wet bulb temperatures. Let's say I tell you the temperature today is 10 degrees Celsius. You can do something with that information. You might think, hmm, that sounds a bit chilly. Maybe I need a jersey before I go outside. If, however, I tell you that the wet bulb temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, there's not much you can do with that information by itself. It could mean that the day is going to be chilly and you need that jersey from earlier, but it could also mean that today is going to be a scorcher, you're going to need sunscreen and you're going to have to drink plenty of water. The word bulb in both wet bulb and dry bulb temperature refers to the bulb on a mercury thermometer. That's the little bit in the bottom. That's the reservoir that contains the mercury, which expands and contracts as it heats up or cools down to indicate temperature. Dry bulb temperature is simply temperature the way you've always understood it. Wet bulb temperature is measured by wrapping the bulb in a water-soaked cloth, also known as a wick, and passing a large amount of air through that or spinning it around a lot so that you get a different temperature. Now, wet bulb temperatures are usually lower than dry bulb temperatures, and that's easy enough to understand. You already have a feeling for this through your experience of going for a shower. When you step into a shower, it's not like you're necessarily cold before you step in. You have your shower, then you step out and all of a sudden it's only after you've stepped out that you feel cold. And that's not because the air in your bathroom is now lower than when you started, nor is it because the water coming out the shower is now cold. It was warm a minute ago when it came out the shower head. The reason you're feeling cold is because the water that's on your skin is an energy thief. As it evaporates, it goes into the air. It requires energy to do that. That energy is known as the heat of vaporization. The water is an energy thief that takes its energy to evaporate from your skin and that feeling on your that leaves your skin feeling cold. It's the same thing when measuring wet bulb temperature. This is quick and easy to demonstrate. Here I start with the air temperature in my kitchen at 18 degrees Celsius. I've let a glass of water stand overnight so that it comes to the same temperature as the air in the kitchen. You can see that when I place the thermocouple into the water, there's basically no change in the temperature. But look at what happens when I take the thermocouple out of the water and expose it to air. Just like you feel cold stepping out of the shower, the thermocouple feels colder because the water takes energy away from the thermocouple as it evaporates. This isn't a completely accurate measurement of the wet bulb temperature because to do that I'd need a constant supply of water in the form of a wick to my thermocouple and I'd also need to be shaking it around to get a good airflow across it. So, wet bulb temperatures are always lower than dry bulb temperatures. Don't memorize those words, you already understand this. You're only cold when you're wet coming out of the shower, not when you're dry going into it. Even though we don't really use mercury thermometers nowadays because everything's digital, we still talk about wet and dry bulb temperatures, despite the absence of an actual bulb. So, where are we going with this? Let's consider what happens in two scenarios. Let's have two thermometers, both of them reading 20 degrees dry bulb temperature. Remember, dry bulb, regular temperature. But imagine one of these is measuring the temperature on a day that is very dry, so there isn't a lot of moisture in the air, while the other is measuring 20 degrees on a very humid day. You know those sweaty, clammy days that you get sometimes, depending on where you live. 
Let's wrap both thermometer bulbs with this wet cloth, the wick. For the dry day, the rate of evaporation of water will be very high because there is plenty of space in the air for the water to escape into. The more water escapes, the more energy it steals from the thermometer. So my thermometer reading is going to be very low. For the really humid day, there isn't much space in the air for the water to evaporate. It's like trying to hang up laundry on a humid day. It'll take forever for your clothes to dry. If there's no space for the water to evaporate, the water stays in the liquid phase and it is not able to steal energy as it vaporizes. Because it isn't doing that, the thermometer reading is not going to be as low. So this is the first part of your answer. It could be that someone is talking about wet bulb temperature, not because they are interested in the wet bulb temperature reading itself, they're actually interested in the difference between the wet and the dry bulb temperatures. The bigger the difference, the drier the air. If there's zero difference, that would mean I have air with 100% relative humidity. The air is saturated with water and there's no space for water to evaporate and hence drop the wet bulb temperature. So a high wet bulb, meaning one that is close to the dry bulb, simply means I have very humid air. If I have the dry bulb temperature, the regular temperature, and I also have a reading for the wet bulb temperature, I am able to use tables or charts to obtain the relative humidity, that is the percentage space available in the air that has already been taken up by water. And I can also get the absolute humidity or the number of grams of water per kilogram of dry air. I only need two out of four of these variables to fully define the other two. Dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures are easy to measure because I just need a thermometer and a wet cloth. Measuring humidity requires a special instrument. So that's part of the answer. The wet bulb temperature is only really interesting because it tells us about air humidity and I can measure wet bulb temperature easily whereas I can't measure relative or direct humidity directly. So it's a proxy for humidity. But there are also applications where the actual number of the wet bulb has some physical importance. And one really good example of that is in the design and operation of cooling towers. I have a cooling tower right over here in a picture of my old workplace. Cooling towers are designed to cool down water Warm water is generated in chemical facilities when water is used as a cooling medium. And the temperature of this warm water is not high enough to be useful. We say that it has a low grade of heat. Because it's not economical to try and do anything with this heat, we pass the warm water through a cooling tower where it is contacted with ambient air. And a portion of it evaporates to cool down the rest so that it can be reused as a cooling medium. The wet bulb temperature represents the theoretical limit for how much I can cool water through evaporation. So if the wet bulb on a given day is very high, remember that what that means, that means the air is really humid, it's very wet. My cooling tower doesn't operate as effectively and the theoretical minimum temperature I can achieve is a lot higher. Cooling towers also have the secondary function of triggering engineers when pictures of cooling towers evaporating water are used by journalists in conjunction with articles about pollution. Yes, water is a greenhouse gas, but I'm really doubtful that that's why these pictures are used.